All right, so we had ourselves a diplomacy, a meeting of the minds, a powwow of the head ambassadors, my tribe to their tribe. I sat down with Drew, the up-and-coming young lion of the atheist community. He'll, he'll be like... He'll be like a Matt Dillahunty five to ten years from now. Some people probably think he's, he's bigger than Matt. He's bigger than Matt Dillahunty. He's bigger than Matt Dillahunty. <laughs> Some people probably think he's more, more in line with what atheism is really all about now. So he's an up-and-coming young lion. I was playfully introduced him as that, but I think it's true. There's the B-listers on their squad. Um, the B-listers on their squad are not B-listers. They just haven't fully arrived yet. So like Telltale Atheist, him, uh, Objectively Dan, you know, maybe Rachel Oates, uh, Shannon and Paul Gia, same idea. They're going to be the A-listers some point in the next five or six years. They're going to be the Aaron Ra, Matt Dillahunty, Seth Andrews, or um, Anthony Magda Bosco. Those are the A-listers. The B-listers are soon to be A-listers if all things keep going the way they're going. So Drew will be one of the main people in their community, you know, one of the go-to people in their community in like five to ten years, so will objectively Dan. So I had a meeting of the minds and I sat down with Drew. Now, it was really, really, really an interesting, good conversation. That's exactly what I want to do on my channel. And I don't necessarily only want to do that with atheists. That's what I want to do. I want to dig into somebody and really find out what's, what they were about, what made them tick. In the, in the case of atheism, how it relates to their deconversion. But I learned something really interesting and new about Drew. The first time he came on my channel, he mentioned punk rock a little bit, and I kind of thought he was a fundamentalist Christian who, like, you know, listened to a little punk rock on the side and kind of thought, oh, this is so cool and dangerous. He, was, he wasn't. He was a total, like, skate punk. Um, that's a total different type of kid altogether. He was like a committed punk rock or skate punk type kid. Those kids are hardcore into punk rock. I know the type. That's a whole tribe unto itself. Now, I wasn't one of them, but I knew them. I knew people like that. Like, I go to my friend who stole the sneakers, okay? I'm going to start piecing this stuff together person, brick by brick so you'll know who I'm talking about. But the guy who stole the sneakers in one of my last stories was this guy, Mike. He was one of my B-level cool kid friends. I'd go to his house, we'd smoke weed, listen to Pink Floyd, and sometimes The Clash. Okay, junior, senior year, his, his parents used to disappear for the weekend. So he'd have a party that would go on the entire weekend. The people who came to that party, they had a leader suitor who was like five miles ahead of the fashion curve. And those guys were committed punk rockers. The, everything down to the Doc Martens. They even told me the science of like the laces that they wore. And they, their record collection was probably identical to Jay from England's at one point. English working class, you know, Clash, Sex Pistols, Specials, um, The Specials, Madness. You know, they, they were really specific about their taste in music. And then they were the first ones that started getting into Public Enemy. And why they started getting into Public Enemy? Because they were adrenaline junkies. They were into that, that, that hard driving edge was what they really wanted the music. So there was some crossover with them. Everybody liked The Clash. Everybody pretty much liked Led Zeppelin because it was aggressive enough for, to satisfy the punks and it was you know, complex and sophisticated enough to satisfy we, the classic rock snobs. And everybody seemed to like Pink Floyd too. You know, because there's all good music. But those guys were him, were like Drew. Now, those guys in real life, those, that's a whole committed tribe unto themselves. Those guys, like, go to every show. They'll go to, like, two shows a week. They'll find a new up-and-coming band, and they'll start following them. They have fanzines of, like, you know, they'll, they'll start to, to get mad at a band if they break through into the mainstream. So once upon a time, they were fans of Green Day. Now they consider Green Day, because Green Day was one of those bands playing at bars and parties and coming up through the circuit. There's usually a circuit in every town across the country. Some are famous, like Seattle. The bands, you know, the bands get good enough that they start breaking through the mainstream, like the grunge scene. That's kind of what the grunge scene was. Really committed punk rock kids, really committed like, to their local scene music kids. And the music scene starts to develop a life of its own. It starts to take on its own flavor. So that's what he was talking about. It's a totally different thing than what I thought he was. He was a really honest-to-God committed punk rock skate kid. Like, those people are religious about their music. Religious. If he started listening off his albums, that things that influenced him, he'd start going 50 deep and he'd name names that I never heard of. 
I guarantee you. He'd start naming names of like, you know, I, I know some of the bands that made it up the food chain a little, like Bad Brains or Fugazi or whatever, because by the time, it, it's hard to explain. If he went to, if he didn't go to a Christian college, he would have been on a college radio DJ. That's what he would have been. And he would have then expanded out from just punk to a lot of stuff. He would be talking about like television, Velvet Underground, blah, 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 blah. I mean, he would start to know everything there was to know about music. He wouldn't just be punk. If he went to a normal college, he went to a Christian college. So he had a dual life, basically. What you heard is, you know, with his, with his Christian friends and family, he was Mr. Committed Christian. And then with his hardcore friends, he'd go and be Mr. Punk Rock Hardcore. And they were totally convinced that he was one of them. Why? Because he was every bit as committed to the music as they were. Every single, you could hear about how he was talking about it. Like, you know, bringing up, not necessarily liner notes. He talks about music the way I do sometimes, where he'll, he'll mention a specific song and remember exactly how he experienced it and why. I can do that with a lot of different stuff. Not just punk rock, though. I can do that with everything from, like, the early Rolling Stones to, you know, going all the way up to, to Public Enemy to going all the way up to the present tense, you know, uh, whatever in the present day. Shakira. <laughs> I like Shakira. Shakira actually can do it with Shakira. I like Shakira a lot. You know, so I'm a little bit more... I was, I'm a little bit more eclectic. I like whatever. That, um, and as I started to describe to him, there's a whole thing that started to happen. Punk just became more important to me. Because I remember the first time I heard... The Violent Femmes had a lot to do with it. Because that album could have been written by me about my high school experience. And I remember the first time I heard, for example... A classic punk rock song that crossed over that everybody liked, institutionalized by the suicidal tendencies. First time I heard that, I heard it at a party in like 10th or 11th grade, and I was like, oh my God, that could have been written by me. It's like, you know, she's like, son, you're on drugs. No, mom, just Spacey. Why don't you go get me a Pepsi? All I wanted is one Pepsi, and she would give it to me. And she's like, and he's like, you're saying I'm crazy when I went to your to your churches, to your higher institutions of learning, I'm not crazy, institution, you're the ones who are crazy, institution, you're driving me crazy, institution. I mean, that was like, that song could have been written by me. That, that, it could have been about what I was going through that day, that week. And the, the name, see, where the parents get all triggered out is the name of the band was The Suicidal Tendencies. Okay, so you're a mother, <laughs> you see your kid is listening to a band called The Suicidal Tendencies, and you start freaking out. But that's half the point. That's why they named the band that, to make your mother troubled. <laughs> that's the whole point of listening to that type of music. Or at least it was when I was growing up, is if your mother wasn't troubled by your album collection, if she wasn't freaking out <laughs> and wringing her hands over the music you were listening to, you weren't doing it right. That was the whole point. My, my mom, I listen to the music I listen to. My son's going insane. Oh, my God. I can't control him anymore. I got to get him to, you know, she, I got to get him to persons in need of supervision. That was the whole point. Your mother was supposed to be wringing her hands over your record collection and, and, and you know, throwing her hands up in despair over the people you were hanging out with. That was part of the, the whole point of doing it. It was fun. It was rebellion. It was rebellion, you know. At a certain level, some of that is harmless and it's supposed to be, and it's part of growing up, it's part of being an adolescent. Now, it can go too far. It can go too far where it's legitimately destructive. Like when Drew's... So for Drew, you meant, he mentioned pretty, pretty frequently that he did not do any drugs or alcohol. Because the first thing somebody would be worried about legitimately is, you know, I had a cousin, for example, really nice kid. And I don't even like telling this story. But of cousins right here locally, really, really good kid, polished, well-educated, clean-cut kid, got shot in a drug deal. That's how he died. Got cut, shot in a drug deal. So you see your kid hooking up with, like, punk rockers, and to the untrained eye, that's what you start imagining. That's the first thing you start worrying about. They're going to start getting in drugs, gonna, and, and it's a realistic fear, to be quite honest with you. Because the kids in my town who were the punk rockers all wound up dabbling in heroin and then probably addicted, most of them. It, me dabbling, okay, me, I wind up dabbling too. That was a big thing in the 90s. That was a big part of it. If you were like, a lot of the people I knew who were in the party circuit wound up dabbling in, heaven, in heroin and then wound up addicted to it. So it's a realistic fear. 
it's a realistic fear. You see your kids getting into this like alternative, like crazy stuff. Some of it is fun, is fun and innocent, but sometimes it goes too far and leads you down dark avenues that you do not recover from. So there's some reality to the hand wringing. There's some like, you know, in a healthy society, in a healthy, in a healthy home, in a healthy religious environment, you have people who parse out the difference. There are healthy boundaries around your behavior. You know, Drew had boundaries that he put around himself internally. Yes, I go hang out with the hardcore kids, but he's not smoking weed, he's not drinking. Okay, had he started smoking weed and drinking, that could have started to turn really dark for him. You know, because it could have started to lead him to other things. Because that's what happened. You know, they used to say, marijuana is a gateway drug, and, you know, and we used to poo-poo gateway drug. Everyone I know who started smoking weed, including myself, did other drugs. And some of those drugs were really, really dangerous, including myself. Every single one, every single solitary person I know who started with marijuana eventually wound up doing really dangerous other drugs. And almost to a man, we all regretted it. All regretted it. I remember one of my friends who was, who was in that B-level cool kids, one of the troublemaker or stoner friends, saying to me, apropos of nothing, we're hanging out drinking beers at his house. I think we were 22, 23 years old. Honest to God, apropos of nothing. God, I wish I'd never taken acid. Just like that. God, I wish I'd never taken acid. Just like that, I promise. And you know what was weird? I knew exactly what he meant. I felt exactly the same way. God, I wish I'd never done that. I don't know, mess with you. We took it young, 16, 17 years old. We took it, the 80s were different. He grew up in, the, in an environment where they were a lot more cognizant. First of all, I grew up in the Bible Belt. I think that had a lot to do with putting some boundaries around that, around some of the more destructive aspects of these behaviors. I grew up in the, the wealthy suburbs right next to the hood. So drugs were part and parcel of everyday life. And everybody I knew, I've talked about this, but everybody I knew smoked weed twice a day including myself in sophomore year, junior year, twice a day for two or three years running. Now, that's not good. That's not good. That's not like I'm being uncool or, un, you know, I, I, I would be, if I had a kid now, I'd be a little, be weird. My, my wife would be a lot more troubled by marijuana use than I would, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I wouldn't care unless it reached some sort of like, some sort of like, if, if I found out it was like smoking weed every once in a while on the weekends or something, I wouldn't care at all. I would probably wouldn't even remember Tell me, you know, I probably wouldn't even remember. It's, oh, yeah, I think, he, I think he said he smoked weed a couple of times. I don't remember. My wife would probably be freaking out. So there'd probably be some discussion. She's more traditional Christian. You know, I grew up a stoner. So I was like, <laughs> like is he doing it twice a day? Oh, he's fine. <laughs> let, him, let, him, let him live a little. You know, that's because that's how we were doing it. Twice a day. I swear to God, twice a day, two days a week. I mean, every day of the week. Twice a day. So now thinking that, if I had a 14-year-old now and he was smoking weed twice a day, I'd be really troubled by that fact. I'd be really disturbed by that. You, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. And I knew everybody I knew did that. Everybody I knew. There wasn't all the eight, all the people went to Ivy League school. In my town, everybody did that. Everybody. The, the people who went to Ivy League schools, the A-level cool kids, did that too. That was the common ground between all of us. The stoner, <laughs> the stoner was the, was the guy who could go anywhere and talk to anybody, and he was always welcome. It was pretty straightforward. You want to pack a bowl? Sure. <laughs> Let's talk about Pink Floyd. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty straightforward. That's how it worked. Now, on, on a certain level, it's fun and innocent, okay? Looking back on it, I can talk about these stories, and I can, honest to God, bring myself two tears of just happiness because there was some of it that was just so fun and innocent, plus it was the 80s. I cannot communicate how fun it was to be a teenager in the 80s in terms of the pop culture environment that you swam in was so like these same stoner cynical kids okay we went to see back to the future in the movie theater i mean think of how fun that actually is that's what we went to see with those same guys <laughs> you know there was some well, i went to see the princess bride in the movie theater with those same guys we went through the progression that that the, what is it, dirt, the, the kid has, that was basically our experience of the movie. We start out really cynical, oh, this is going to be so dumb. I can't believe someone pushed us to watch this crud. And, and by the end of the movie, we were quoting the lines. You know, we were like, you know, hello, my name is Arika Batar. We would do that for months, do that for years. People still do it to this day. I saw that in the movie theater. You go, hello, my name is Enrique Montoya. You kill my father, prepare to die. Is I think that's it. I, I used to know that cold. I don't know that one as well, but... Uh, 
What was the other one? The I mean, people still do that to this day. I saw that in the movie theater with cynical punk rockers. And like, we saw The Breakfast Club at a mall. We, we like smoked a, a, a joint in the parking lot and went to see The Breakfast Club. Live. You know, about, I was at a private school at that time. So it was pretty much about my life right then and there. It was like, I mean, it was so, there was, a, there was an aura of innocence. I call that now the grace of God. That you were young and innocent and God kind of looked the other way while you did stupid stuff. I call that the grace of God. Yeah, you were doing stupid stuff and some of it was toxic and unhealthy. That's the nature of being a kid. It would be nice if it were a little bit healthier for the kids. But it's kid stuff. You know, sometimes it takes you to next level, dangerous, really hardcore stuff. But for the most part, it's kid stuff. You know, it's, it's adolescent rebellion. You're flexing your muscles. I want to be a big man, teenager, you know. You know, I can I could honestly bring myself to tears just talking about some some of the some of the things that some of how it was in high school. In seventh and eighth grade, I could I could probably do it without even trying. Why? Because I was just so happy. I mean, I was just it was so idyllic. The town I grew up in had to say it was idyllic to a certain degree. You know, I understand that that's not a lot of people's experience in high school, but mine was. The parts about it that were troubling and dark is because drugs and alcohol start to get dark and troubling. The the the, the devil is lurking on the outskirts. And looking for a way to destroy people, metaphorically speaking. You know, it's innocent and fun up to a certain point. Then you cross a certain threshold and it's just destructive. It's just destructive. And I saw a lot of people that, that, that inadvertently crossed that threshold. Story I told you about that guy, Al, Al, was totally legitimate. Apropos of nothing. Apropos of nothing. God, I wish I'd never done LSD. God, I wish I... And I knew exactly what it meant. Because it fried your brain in a weird way. Made you... It was... It was really interesting why you experienced it, but months later, you still had something a little wrong. <laughs> something was a little wrong the whole time. I don't know. It's hard to explain, but it's, it's dangerous. A lot of this stuff is dangerous. It's more dangerous, you know, so it's complicated. But getting back to the... Do I have more time? Let's see. Hold on. Getting back to the story with Drew, you know... So he was legitimately had almost a dual life. On the one hand, he was a really astringent type of fundamentalist Christian, more so than most of the people. If you listen between the lines, I mean, some of the stuff that he was talking about was deeply unhealthy. People in his, people in his church environment, his family environment, who don't listen to any music at all. Any music at all. Never mind, we won't go near secular music, which is unhealthy in and of itself, but like deeply unhealthy. Like, we won't listen to, and we won't do anything, but pff, I don't even know what they're doing. Uh, that's not, that to me is not holiness. It's really not. That's not what Christianity is about. Yes, I understand. I understand Christians who are strict, and I even understand them being a little bit more strict than I would choose to be. For example, my wife is more strict along those traditional religious lines. I endorse it up to a certain point. I kind of recognize that it's right up to a certain point, you know? Even limiting your intake of like horror movies and whatnots. Yeah, it's mostly harmless, but it's mostly harmless. That's the part that the religious people don't get. There's a healthy relationship that you can have with these like, this like, what the religious people are responding to is actually true. Out there in the real world, the, the culture is toxic to a certain degree. It's unhealthy. It's poisonous. A steady diet of it will... You turn you into a serial killer, basically. Turn you into total bad. Turn you into a Florida resident or a serial killer, and most of the time, that's the exact same thing. That's why Florida is the way it is. That's why Florida, because a steady diet of today's Americana will, you know, you go from watching the Tiger King to to like, uh, you know, to to watching the mass thing. I don't know. A steady diet of this stuff will start to poison you from the inside out. But most people have enough sense to understand that we're not talking about a steady diet. You know, you don't, go watch, you don't go watch 50 horror movies in a row. You go watch one. And then if you're a Christian, pray for forgiveness. <laughs> Sorry I did that, Lord. That was really wrong of me. But I really enjoyed it when this guy was stabbing these, you know, pray for forgiveness afterwards. There's a way to balance this out with sanity and reasonableness. There's a way to be a holy, upright servant of Christ. Where that, you are actually committed to Christianity. It's the most important thing in your life. Honest to God, there really is a way. And I'm in the process of trying to negotiate that out correctly. 
where you have some relationship with the world at large. You're in the world, but not of the world. But you're not like, oh, it's all evil and corrupt. No, because some of it's just harmless and fun. And some of it has real value to it. And so you don't throw all of it out. You know, some of the bands he mentioned, would I endorse them as a Christian? Uh, I wouldn't care. The Clash, I would. I honest to God would. There's not even a lot of cursing in the Clash. There isn't. There's an undercurrent of righteousness. There's an undercurrent of, like, true righteousness. Like, you know, it's hard to explain. The Ramones, I would endorse fully as a Christian. It's innocent. It's fun. You know, out on the playground, the bomb, bomb, we can read to ride to rock away beach. We can hit a ride to Rockaway Beach. Bus ride, it's too slow. Pass out the I would sing the Ramones in karaoke, honestly. I don't really, I don't, for some reason, I don't know the lyrics off the top of my head. I'm not sure why. But uh, I, would have sung, I would have sung that song in karaoke, but the Ramones songs are all, they're not long enough for karaoke. They're like two and a half minutes long. You've got to pick a long song to do in karaoke or you'd be frustrated. So I would, I would I'd do the Clash of Karaoke all the time. All the time. Goes over really well. Somebody always, every single time I'm there, somebody always thanks me for doing the Clash. I thank you so much for doing the Clash. It's so important. <laughs> it was so important. Yeah, it's, it's karaoke bar, dude. T -t Take it down a notch. Get, get, a, get real. No, it's fun. I mean, it's fun. But th that does happen. And I've done Green Day in karaoke. Green Day, he probably poo-poos. What, what, what happened to Green Day is they started out as one of the bands that the fanzine, the, 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 the skate punk kids like him, were really into and they were one of them and then they once they get a little too famous then the kids kind of like move on to the next band and sometimes they accuse the band of selling out sometimes the band does sell out sometimes it's just the, you know the band outgrew the environment so sometimes i don't know in green day's case i just like a couple of songs and they go well in karaoke hear the sound of the pouring rain coming in like an armageddon flame to shame the ones who died without a name well it's not, that doesn't sound all that good all right well whatever early in the morning just waking up just conversating just conversating improvisating and innovating that's what we do here kids and as always the rules of the road are the same you don't like it they're the cat videos go watch the cat videos because i don't care that is all for now. Just my observations. Some things that were occurring to me after that little little powwow. My little ambassadorship. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff there to, to parse over. And if you were listening carefully, that's the type of conversation that you can listen to more than once. And if you, can really, if you really listen to that conversation carefully, you can learn a lot. Both about Drew, about the atheist community, about growing up in the, in, in the aughts. There's a lot, of, a lot of actually really relevant, really valuable information that was shared in that. And that's what I'm trying to do all the time. Just get someone to open up, get somewhere real, get, get them to give us insights that you can't get any other way except listening to someone tell their story. So there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.